Okay, so we have two more talks and we're continuing along the lines of technology and future missions. Our first speaker is Rob Staley from JPL. He's the assistant manager for advanced concepts um, in the instruments division. Uh, and he's gonna be talking about, um, what's the title of your talk? I don't remember. Small spacecraft. <laughs> Small spacecraft and what we can do with them to explore the moon. Thanks for coming back from the break. Um, so we heard uh, from uh, just before the break about some uh, larger scale missions. It seems to, to some of us at JPL that there may be room for some smaller scale missions for uh, resource exploration and as well as for science. And uh, smaller scale generally means smaller in dollars, which means smaller in size. And so one of the things I'm here to tell you is that JPL has been in the small spacecraft business longer than anyone else in the United States. Uh, that's because that's all we could launch was 14 kilograms for the uh, first satellite. So uh, I'm, I've heard that, I'm, I learned in high school that plagiarism is defined as when you copy from one and research is defined as when you copy from 10 or more people. So this is actually copied from about uh, uh, six other presentations on which I'm co-author of a couple of them. This is one of them, the NIAC work on interplanetary CubeSats. Uh, Tony Freeman made a presentation at the CubeSat Developers Workshop. Actually, uh, uh, Charles Norton made the presentation for Tony with Tony's name on it about what JPL is doing. Uh, I was co-author with a, a just graduated student from UT Austin on some uh, solar sail trajectories around the moon. We'll talk about that. The, uh, there's the INSPIRE mission, uh, which is being built right now at JPL, which we hope will be the first uh, beyond Earth CubeSat uh, with launch readiness next year. I'll tell you why I think that could be a precursor to some of the things this group might be interested in. And uh, then some little larger spacecraft concepts by uh, Ed Riedel and his team, also at JPL. And then I've uh, stolen a few slides with his permission from Ben, ben Malfris and the CubeSat work that they're doing at Moorhead State which is one of several leading universities in the United States uh, in the CubeSat business. So I'm planning to talk to you about CubeSats and SmallSats, but let me, to get started here, let me uh, just take a quick poll. How many of you feel you understand what a CubeSat is? Okay, so there's several who don't, so I'll try to give that explanation. I'm not confining this talk to just CubeSats but that's the, everyone knows what a small satellite is. You saw one on the first slide, and, the, and LCROSS is an excellent example of a much more recent relatively small satellite. Uh, CubeSats start with um, a unit, what's called a unit 1U of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, so basically one liter in volume. It's a particular form factor, three of which fit together in a launch container which has been qualified to launch on, on a number of launch vehicles around the world. And because of that, they go through a much less than normal expenditure of effort on qualifying the spacecraft to launch. And because they're so lightweight, they frequently fit in the launch margin of missions with a primary customer going to whatever destination those happen to go to. There have been something like 75 CubeSats launched since 1999. Uh, and this is the, uh, the image that you see over there is of the, uh, the concept for the Inspire satellite that's being built up. Um, the launch costs for CubeSats run anywhere from zero to about uh, $300,000 uh, if you buy it commercially. If you get a NASA launch selected uh, through the Educational Launch Initiative program, the fee is $30,000, which is waived if you show up for the launch. Uh, you're charged if you don't show up. Uh, or the, then there's the within NASA CubeSat launch initiative. JPL has several launches going on that. And in that case, uh, all the costs are borne by the Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate are not charged to the PI of the mission. So there has been some real science done from CubeSats. One of the first uh, uh, big boosters of, the, of CubeSats was the National Science Foundation. They did a number of, made a number of awards in universities and the particular diagram that you see over here came from the uh, uh, University of Michigan RACS-2 satellite. Uh, it was the first paper that used data uh, that 
used primarily data generated by the CubeSat that resulted in a publication in Nature or Science. And this was an uh, ionospheric investigation. Uh, and then you'll see here, this, uh, this is one of the slides from Ben Moorhead, uh, from uh, Ben Melfris of Moorhead State. Uh, this, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but this satellite is up there right now uh, and doing a, well, this is number two, okay, and is doing a cosmic x-ray background measurement and uh, I expect the results of that will be published in, in due time. So uh, the size of a CubeSat, what you see there is a so-called 6U, think of a cereal box. It's 10 by 20 by 30 centimeters, so it's about that big. And the work that some of us did at JPL with some outside investigators about two years ago showed that that was kind of the threshold size at which you could go beyond Earth, uh, do useful scientific measurements, have a self-propelled spacecraft, and provide the needed telecommunications, attitude control, and other functions. And, and so uh, this could be one of the size ranges that we consider later in the workshop as a host for payloads that might help characterize uh, lunar volatiles. So we've had a lot of CubeSat activity at JPL. This is a summary of, uh, yeah? You said size, you said that was minimum size? Uh, I, the six U was the minimum size at which with today's technology, you, it looks like you can do scientifically useful things beyond Earth escape, meaning the moon, Mars, asteroids, and so on and still provide all the functions required for a host payload, including getting the data back and including propulsion to get to wherever it is you're going. Uh, we tried to fit that in 3U and it just, fitting all those functions in 3U just doesn't work. Uh, the good news is the first 6U CubeSat is scheduled to be launched later this year by NASA in a 6U canister. Uh, and there are several launch vehicles now being qualified for the 6U canister that have already launched uh, 3U canisters. So I'm not gonna read many of the words from the charts here while I go through them, so you can read those, but, but I'll try and uh, illustrate the, the main message here. But we have a number of activities going on. We have some launches uh, coming up from the JPL efforts, and JPL is just a very small fraction of the overall CubeSat activity uh, that's going on around the world. Uh, if you heard of CubeSats three years ago and thought they didn't have enough capability to do, to support some of the kind of science observations we might be thinking about, things have changed. This field is moving very, very rapidly. And so there are now uh, slated for launch CubeSats with an ability to point to better than half a degree three axis uh, with reasonable stability. And there's a, a scheme that MIT and JPL have worked on for getting a, a pointing for a, a particular instrument, this is for an astrophysics investigation, down to a, a couple of arc seconds. Uh, and uh, then in propulsion, there, ha there has been at least one cold gas system flown, even though propulsion is excluded. If you look at the sort of top level requirements to get, uh, to get a free launch, that requirement can and has been waived from time to time if you prove certain, if you, can prove that your payload doesn't provide any hazard to the primary payload that's on, that's on the vehicle or the launch vehicle itself. Uh, but there are a number of schemes for getting dramatically increased propulsion. Uh, in the case of solar sail, up to uh, a kilometer and a half per second per year with technology that's available today and probably double to triple that uh, with technology available over the next five years or so. Uh, there's also a number of electric propulsion schemes which are in, in a similar, uh, similar uh, delta V regime. Uh, the, the communications equipment, uh, the, the computing equipment aboard CubeSats uh, is dramatically improving. You'll see a slide on that later. Uh, power, if you're out, for 50 watt average is possible in Earth orbit. If you're out in interplanetary space, of course, you can do a little better than that because you're not in shadow half the time. Uh, but the moon is probably similar to the Earth. I would expect in, uh, uh, in a couple of years to be able to get up to about 70 watts over orbit average power at Earth or Moon, probably not a lot more than that. Uh, and uh, then, as I said, 6U CubeSats are coming along. So uh, JPL presently has seven funded CubeSats uh, in build right now. Six of them are on here. These are all, all of these are technology experiments for one purpose or another. The first one is a uh, high power uh, processor, rad hard processor on board, there's the intelligent payload experiment that we're doing jointly with Goddard. The first one is with the University of Michigan. Uh, we also have Cal Poly San Luis Obispo as a partner on IPEX. Griffiths, Griffiths is another one with Michigan with a uh, 
uh, a new uh, readout integrated circuit applicable to uh, one of the Earth Science Decadal Survey missions. There's a microwave radiometer experiment called, uh, called RACE that we're doing in partnership with UT Austin. Uh, low mass radio science transponder, our partner on that is Stanford. And then uh, one of the Edison selections was the uh, ISARA uh, combined uh, photovoltaic array with KA band uh, antenna to provide uh, uh, much higher data rates than people have come to, to think about from CubeSats. So those are all Earth orbital. So what does it take to get from uh, an Earth orbital CubeSat to a, to a beyond Earth capability. Well, there are six technologies that can be added to what we're doing today in various portions for different missions uh, that add up to, to that capability. First and foremost is you've got to be able to survive the interplanetary environment. Um, that's turning out to be less challenging than many of us thought before, uh, but it remains to be demonstrated. That's one of the primary purposes of the INSPIRE mission. Telecom, of course, is, is not simple. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that, but from, from lunar distances, uh, several kilobits a second are possible out of that form factor to ground assets uh, that we have at DSN and others. Uh, propulsion, I mentioned that. Uh, going beyond the moon, uh, the interplanetary superhighway is a, is a way to magnify the, the ability of the Delta V to get to a variety of destinations. Uh, we've looked at some instruments, but probably none that are specifically applicable to the interests of this group, which is uh, an area that I hope we'll explore during the next few days. Uh, and then using onboard processing to do some of the processing that we typically do on the ground, instead moving that up to be a few centimeters from the focal plane so that there's a higher information content in a particular data stream that's coming down. So one example of this, this came out of a, a, an unsuccessful Edison proposal. It was basically a combination of the, the Planetary Society's uh, LightSail-1 satellite and the University of Michigan's RAX-2 satellite. Uh, and by having the 6U volume instead of those were both in 3U, we were able to devote 2U to a, a deployed solar sail uh, of the kind of performance that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so a somewhat a variant of that is now in build as JPL's seventh funded CubeSat is this interplanetary nanospacecraft pathfinder in a relevant environment. Andy Klesch had to stay up all night just to think of that, uh, of that acronym. But it's actually two CubeSats. It's two 3U CubeSats to be launched, uh, to be ready for launch next year. I don't believe the actual launch has been designated, but NASA has said that they will uh, provide it a launch to Earth Escape. I believe it was number seven out of 24 in the last CubeSat launch uh, selection. And then two more projects coming up at JPL is one is a low frequency radio antenna, and then we're working with, uh, uh, we're sort of the junior partner to Sergio Pellegrino here at Caltech on an experiment having to do with uh, assembling large, large apertures from uh, small ones. So INSPIRE, I believe, will be a precursor to any mission that this group might talk about that fits in the CubeSat size realm uh, in terms of demonstrating the ability to operate in deep space and the ability to communicate and be tracked and navigated by the deep space network. So it'll actually be two 3U CubeSats. They will be launched basically into a drift away from Earth uh, when the upper stage is disposed of to escape. And they will communicate with the DSN um, up and down link at X band, and there will be a UHF cross link. So one of the tests will be go up to one satellite across and then back down the other, and that sort of thing. Uh, all the while uh, attempting to uh, determine the position of the satellite to, uh, to accuracy on the order of away from Earth, away from a celestial body, a kilometer or so, but we believe we'll be able to get radiometric accuracy from the, both Doppler uh, and time of flight tracking uh, down to approximately the one meter level uh, with, uh, with, the with the radio equipment that's being built right now for this satellite. So it's comparable to the accuracy that we get with the same, with radiometric and Doppler tracking on the DSN. Uh, this is uh, Inspire a few weeks ago, uh, the so-called FlatSat configuration that's popular among the CubeSat world for putting things together. It's a much more build it, try it, test it, uh, culture in that world than uh, plan, 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 and finally build. There's typically sev several builds, uh, build, on, build, test, fix, uh, go on to the next. Uh, and the typical JPL's first CubeSat the, with the uh, University of Michigan, 
the time from funding to launch readiness was 14 months. Uh, the Inspire satellite is being built, I think, on a 22-month schedule from, uh, from first funding, which was last, the very end of November, until launch readiness uh, next summer. Uh, solar sails, I mentioned, I just wanted to show this. This is actually from Peter Schulte at UT Austin, who's on his way to, to being a grad student at, at Georgia Tech. But solar sails have been flown. The, this is the Japanese Icaros uh, spacecraft. And then, of course, NASA's Light Sail D that was a collaboration between Ames and, and Marshall. Uh, the Icaros, the Light Sail, the Nano Sail D was basically a drag device, although it demonstrated the deployment required for a sail. But Icaros did deployment and uh, precise navigation and, and orbit maneuvering as, as a subspacecraft from, Japanese, from Japan's last mission uh, to Venus. Uh, the deployment sequence for this is the Planetary Society's engineering model. It's 5.6 meters on the side. This deployment sequence, Lou, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is about two minutes long from uh, a little longer. How long? Was it four minutes? Okay. Okay. And then there's, uh, so the plan is to scale this up from 5.6 meters on a side to about eight meters on a side. Uh, and of course, we have more packaging volume because we're in 6U, so there's full 2U for packaging. The uh, spars would be out of a little thinner, a little more expensive material. The actual deployment, uh, the structural spars on this are actual for real uh, carpenter tape uh, measures that are welded together down the seam. So it's a, one of the less expensive parts of the spacecraft. If you spend a little more money, you can get away with a thinner material uh, and longer booms and still not break the bank. So. Um, I'm going to show you some trajectories here. If you can't get a ride to escape, uh, if the best you can do is a ride to geostationary orbit, there are about 15 of those rides every year. Uh, and some of the manufacturers of those satellites are very open to carrying uh, uh, CubeSats as subsatellites uh, to be deployed once they get to orbit. And so if you've got a pretty sluggish sail, this, this is actually the light sail uh, designed for low Earth orbit. Uh, it takes three and a half years, which isn't particularly interesting uh, for getting out of geostationary orbit. But if you go to a 10 kilogram spacecraft and a 10 meter on a side sail, uh, then you begin to get into interesting territory. Uh, and uh, I still think for the kind of missions that we'll talk about, we'll be interested in, in going on one of those upper stages to escape. But this is sort of a backup option. And where I think the technology is going 10 years or so from now is a 20 meter on a side uh, sail which gives you a very interesting escape time of, of uh, just several months. So the concept of operations that Peter Schulte did for his, uh, his undergraduate research project had the uh, spacecraft launching on the, aboard the uh, Space Launch System test flight in 2017. I've actually seen a document that's postulated several 6U uh, containers to be right on the sort of upper stage adapter of the, spacecraft, of, the, of the launch vehicle. Whether that'll come to pass or not, I don't know. Uh, but I know some of the folks in the Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate are, are very serious about that. Uh, and so the 6U container plops your satellite out. Uh, in this case, Peter had, the, had it being deployed in lunar orbit, and then he did an analysis that showed uh, it going from 110 kilometer circular orbit out to lunar escape, uh, basically to transfer to Earth-Moon L2. And, uh, and so, he did that with a, he used a very simple control law in his simulation to do that. There are much better control laws than this, but basically you're full on to the sun while you're going, you're going around the moon like this. The sun is off to the left, and so you're full on to the sun, adding energy to the orbit during the time you're going away from the sun. And then you basically feather the sail to the wind so it's, so it's not slowing you down during the other part of the orbit. And of course, the turn time between these two places is a critical parameter that helps determine the performance. And so this, this was the result of his simulation uh, with the 10 meter sail and 10 kilograms. Uh, at JPL, we looked at several different kinds of missions that, that, uh, that this showed could be done. The, the point was, I, I think in most cases, we're, we'll be better off using a sail or an electric propulsion uh, equivalent to you worth of electric propulsion to get us from escape to whatever the destination orbit is that we need to make our measurements from, as opposed to the other way around. Uh, but for, from, a, from just a evaluating the trajectory point of view, if you can go up, you can go down uh, just as well. 
So the radio, of course, is, is a, a challenge, and uh, our uh, telecommunications division has met that challenge. They have a 1U uh, prototype now of an X-band uh, radio that's based on the, uh, it basically has much of the functionality, including that that we require for telecom and nav, of the small deep space transponder and the electro radios that are in orbit around Mars right now, except they managed to squash it into a much smaller package, basically just because of the advances in electronics technology uh, since those things were defined and built. Um, and uh, so this is, this is one of the, the boards uh, that they're getting ready uh, to, uh, to put into Enspire. So ENS of the three U in Enspire, about um, a little over half of you, we have four centimeters, a little under half of you, four centimeters of that 10 by 10 stack will be devoted to, uh, to this so-called IRIS radio. IRIS is just the name they gave it. It's not an acronym. IRIS is the uh, daughter of Electra in Greek mythology. And Electra, of course, is the radio that's in orbit around Mars right now on a couple of different spacecraft. Uh, but anyway, so IRIS will use up that four centimeters uh, and then there will be another, I believe it's a commercial uh, UHF radio in there that they, that they have purchased. Another option that increases the, the data rate availability but is at a lower TRL uh, is being pursued by Hamid Hamadi who supervises the optical telecommunications group at JPL. Uh, and he believes they've figured out how to get uh, a decent optical telecom subsystem into 1U. Um, that's, this particular configuration has a six centimeter aperture and it's capable of getting two kilobits a second back to uh, Palomar uh, at, at night, uh, about a quarter that data rate during the day, as long as the sun is more than about 20 or 30 degrees away from where the spacecraft is in the sky. But they've since looked at a different detector and increasing this aperture from six to seven centimeters and that looks like that'll increase the uh, uh, the, the data rate capability by about a factor of two or three. Uh, and from the moon, uh, I haven't done the math, but, but it's, it's just inverse square law. So if you can get uh, five or six kilobits per second from Mars, uh, you can get uh, considerably more than 10 times that from the moon. Uh, so this is the receiving equipment. Uh, it could be the five meter Hale telescope, which Caltech owns and JPL has time available on and ha has done some laser telecom reception experiments. Uh, more difficult to secure time on is the Large Binocular Telescope, which provides that much greater data rate. I think it's about a factor of four increase. And the transmit terminal exists on, uh, uh, in the Angeles National Forest, just about 40 or 50 miles from here, uh, as part of uh, JPL's Table Mountain Observatory. So instrumentation uh, is um, another area of, of a big challenge. This, this is a concept that Sakos Maroulis, so the, the architect for the moon mineralogy mapper on Chandrayaan, that he put together to fit in 2U of a CubeSat. Uh, and uh, it appears that it'll work. It's got a field of view of about 14 uh, degrees. It has an abbreviated spectral range. Uh, there are ways of extending the spectral range. We're working on some very small coolers at JPL. They're basically commercial coolers that we're modifying to be compatible with a CubeSat form factor and the amount of power available and stuff like that. Uh, and so being able to get out to 3,000 nanometer wavelength uh, is, is challenging, but I think possible. Uh, and perhaps a little beyond that. Um, this is the board that flew aboard the, the COVE uh, experiment, the CubeSat onboard processor validation experiment on the University of Michigan satellite. Um, that satellite and its neighbor in the, uh, in the uh, P-Pod that it was launched in from Montana State University, as far as we can tell, they managed to achieve the first automated rendezvous and docking uh, in Earth orbit and the Montana State satellite was broadcasting at the received frequency of the, of the Michigan satellite. So while the satellite is operating, we've never been able to get a command in. So this is slated for reflight Cove 2. It's all built, packaged, shipped, uh, and getting ready to be integrated with the launch vehicle, and that's supposed to launch in December. So better luck next time. Um, Another approach to high power onboard processing uh, is the one that Moorhead State and, and uh, Honeywell have been working on. Ben will be able to tell us more about that uh, if there's a useful time to do that uh, during the workshop. But if you look at this, it's taking up one quarter of a liter, so 2.4 uh, centimeters of that 10 by 10 plan form and weighs about uh, 350 grams. Uh, and do you have, do you have a, a plan to fly this? Is, that, is this slated for flight, Ben? Yeah.
Okay, so even better performance than, than what we see here. And what year is that planned for? Right, okay, <laughs> enough said. <laughs> so there's a variety of ways of putting together all these components, but this, this is one particular plan form. This is out of the, uh, the Solwise uh, Edison proposal. With 2U for a solar sail, uh, this one had one, one or one and a half U available for the instrument, uh, and then the other subsystems fit in the rest, uh, and I think it was generating about 70 watts power uh, with this arrangement. Uh, so I mentioned solar sails a lot, but, but up and coming are some electric propulsion technologies. This particular one was just chosen by NASA last week to get uh, funding for technology development. Uh, Colleen Maurice Redding at JPL is the PI on that. Uh, two other selections, one was from BUSIC and one from MIT, and the, the, all of them are uh, high specific impulse uh, EP that's capable of delivering uh, one to a few kilometers per second to a CubeSat over a reasonable period of time. Uh, uh, Microelectrospray propulsion. Yeah. I'm glad I remembered that. And then there are ways of putting, if, assuming that thruster works, there are ways of putting them together on a larger spacecraft and doing both uh, main, main propulsion and attitude control by pulsing the, the thrusters. This is a concept from uh, Ed Riedel and his team. Th this particular spacecraft is in the 100 kilogram uh, realm. Um, and you can see, uh, those of you familiar with L-Cross will, will be familiar with the Esper ring kind of structure that this is uh, associated with. So he's, uh, I'm sorry, I said 100 kilogram range. It's about a 50 kilogram spacecraft. So will we be doing solar sails to the moon with instruments relevant to this workshop? I don't know, but it's one possibility that, that uh, I want to make sure people understand uh, is on the table. Uh, and uh, then, of course, you have to get all the data down. Uh, the Deep Space Net you know all about, and in fact, the Deep Space Net is working very closely with Inspire Project to make sure that the, uh, the transmitter, the receiver, the navigation equipment, and the, the Coordinating Committee for Space Data Standards, or CCSDS protocol, is going to be implemented throughout. Uh, but you all know the DSN apertures uh, are heavily subscribed, and so uh, we've been talking with Moorhead State about the possibility of, of using their antenna. And there are a number of other universities that have uh, apertures like this although I don't think there are any that have, have quite as advanced a set of equipment behind the aperture to do some of the things that uh, are of interest to a group like this. Um, so at JPL, this, this is how this room looked about three months ago. It's now full of people and equipment, and they're building the two Inspire satellites. Uh, we've got a CubeSat ground station up and running uh, on the rooftop for low Earth orbit satellites, and of course the, the DSN needs no introduction. Uh, we're even working on updating a, a, a not a 2008 version, but a 2013 uh, cost estimating handbook uh, to help us understand how to, how to estimate the cost of these missions uh, because it's, it's new territory for all of us. So, uh, so I just wanted to point out that, that there are a number of things going on, not just at JPL and not just with all the university partners that we have. We've got about six university partners that we're working, on, working with on different projects. Uh, I think on every one of those projects, the, the university partner is delivering a critical element of the spacecraft. In some cases, they're building the spacecraft and we're building the payload. In some cases, it's the other way around. So, so things aren't entirely sorted out uh, as to who, who best does what, which I, is, I've found one of the really enlightening things about the whole CubeSat world, that, that people aren't, aren't too stuck in, in roles that they've had for decades. It's new to everybody and everyone is innovating at a, at a higher rate than I've seen in any other part of the space business. Okay, I can handle it.